Right, we're going to sing Come Unto Me. Welcome to uh, Mission Independent Baptist Church this Amen. Sunday morning. Amen. And we're going to sing Come Unto Me. Praise the Lord. Hear the, the blessed, blessed Savior calling the oppressed. Oh, ye heavy laden, come to me and rest. Come no longer tarry, I your load will bear. Bring me every burden, bring me every care. Come unto me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Hear me and be blessed. I am meek and lowly. Come and trust my mind. Come, my yoke is easy. And my burdens lie. Disappointed, wandering here and there, dragging chains of doubt and loaded down with care. Do unholy feelings struggle in your breast? Bring your case to Jesus, He will give you rest. Come unto me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. mountains dark with sin and shame stumbling toward the pit of hell's consuming flame by the powers of sin deluded and oppressed hear the tender shepherd come to me and rest come unto me i will give you rest take my yoke upon you I am meek and lowly, come and trust my might, come, my yoke is easy, and my burdens light. Have you by temptation often conquered been, has a sense of weakness brought distress within? Christ will sanctify you if you'll claim his best. In the Holy Spirit, he will give you rest. Come unto me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, hear me and be blessed. I am meek and lowly, come and trust my heart. is easy and his burdens is right. calm, Amen. he says. Well, we're going to have Ben come now. We got Ben Purcell right. with his lovely wife here and they're, uh, uh, Jenny, they're here from Lisbon Baptist. Uh, they're from Lisbon, True Indiana, Baptist. True Baptist, True, True, True Light, Light Baptist. Baptist of Lisbon, Indiana. And they're from Indianapolis yep. and Ben's going to come teach. Come, Brother Ben, and teach us. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be here. So, as Gary was saying, we're we're in Indianapolis. We've met everybody here, though, and uh, we go to True Light Baptist uh, in Liston, Indiana, and we um, I teach the at the Sunday school at the church, the adult Sunday school class. I've been doing that for a couple of years, and I. Uh, we'll go to preach in the jail. We go into the jail 
uh, that's in the county uh, where our church is, and we'll go there every other week. And so I've been doing that for a couple years too. Uh, but I've never, I've never actually uh, spoken in the main, you know, the main event, the main service. Amen. So I'm very nervous. This is my first time uh, doing that, and uh, so. Uh, bear with me. Uh, thank you for being here as a blessing. Amen. Praise and, uh, the Lord. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, God, I believe, has directed me to uh, some thoughts here, and I'm going to do my best to uh, deliver them. Uh, but I'm going to pray first before I get started here. Father, uh, thank you so much mm. for uh, the opportunity to be here this morning. Mm. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for mm. us all already this morning, gathering us all here today. Yes, uh, I'm thankful for uh, your help in preparing mm. uh, these remarks. Uh, this morning, mm. and uh, I'm praying that you'd help me to learn as well, even more as I teach, as you so often uh, do uh, for me. I'm thankful for the Bible. I'm yes. uh, thankful that we have the Bible, that you, uh, that you wrote it, that you preserved it for us, that we can trust it, uh, God, and, uh, and I'm just praying that, you'd, uh, that this would be a help, uh, that this would mm. be edifying uh, to the listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, well... I am nervous uh, to do this because uh, I've never exactly done it in, in this uh, format before. And I'm also nervous because, uh, you know, this uh, just the Mission Independent uh, Church has just been a very important part of my, uh, both Jenny and I's uh, Christian uh, life. Um, you know, we grew up, um, I was Catholic and Jenny was Lutheran. And we, Mickey just said something about, well, didn't you, uh, didn't you do these songs in uh, your Catholic or Lutheran church or something? And the, the, that made me think, you know, in those churches, um, a, you know, they're not, they're not really preaching the gospel, and so we were not saved. We didn't get saved till, till later, till I was 26. Um, but, um, but also, there's a, there's a real like passivity that you develop, a real mm. passiveness. That you develop in those mm. churches, you don't. Uh, you never think you're going to have to actually get up and speak or pray, you know, publicly. Yeah. So I remember coming here, and it's you know not a lot of people, and everybody can yeah. see everybody, and we're singing these songs, and everybody mm. can see you, and then then we come on Friday nights and pray, and we were praying out loud, <laughs> and I remember thinking, even just that, I remember thinking, I'll never do that, <laughs> I'll never do that. I mean, I was saved, I was happy to be to be at yeah. a church where people believe the Bible. But I remember thinking, I'm never going to pray out loud. And uh, But they helped me. Gary and Mickey and Pastor Ford and uh, Brother Bob was here yes. a lot and, and Miss Sharon. And I still remember even uh, uh, Pastor Perez coming and yes. filling in. And I just have very vivid memories of that whole time. It was really the first uh, fellowship that I, that I ever had as a Christian. And so mm. all those, uh, all the advice that was given, even if people didn't think it was advice uh, to me it really mattered to me and helped me in my Christian Amen. life I'll, specifically I'll never forget when Gary I was very intimidated by the idea of, of witnessing to people I, I knew that I needed to uh, but I thought I don't think I'll ever be able to, to tell somebody you know about Jesus or anything and I remember uh, Gary one time said uh, you know you talk to people and he didn't think he was giving me advice necessarily I wasn't asking him how do you witness to people he was just kind of telling me about his life and he said you know when you talk to people he said you know just make sure God's involved just make just keep God involved I remember that those exact words and I thought I could do that I can do that I could I could make sure God's involved and that was what I needed at that time if I wouldn't have gotten up to that next step, you know, I don't know if I ever would have got to the next step or the next step or the next step. So not that I'm doing perfect or anything, but that was needed for me at that time. And uh, so without this church being here, um, I definitely would not be teaching Sunday school. I definitely would not be uh, preaching at the jail. I would not have been able to witness to my friends or my family or anything like that. And so I'm just very grateful uh, for this church being here. It's enabled me to uh, do all those things. And uh, with God's help, uh, of course, and so God, you know, God used this to do it. So, Amen. Uh, so I'm uh, grateful to be here, and I'm excited about this topic. I'm going to talk about uh, something that God's really been uh, stirring up my mind about uh, in the last, really over the course of the last year. And so the title of this lesson is, uh, How Do We Understand the Bible? Mm -hmm. And the subtitle here is, uh, The Same Way We Understand Everything Else. Okay, and so that might seem a little 
weird, uh, but uh, bear with me. I'm going to explain it. And uh, I think you're going to think it makes sense. But how do we understand the Bible? I believe it's the same way we understand anything else. And so uh, my thoughts on this topic, how do we understand the Bible, have really uh, changed uh, over time. When I got saved, uh, I, was a, I was a teaching assistant at a college uh, here in, in Chicago. And I was very much into uh, what you might call intellectualism or... Um, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of knowing the truth, you know, by my own powers, studying myself and coming to know the truth. I thought I was smarter than Christians. I thought I was smarter than religious people. I thought they were superstitious. And uh, so when I got saved, I, 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 re I realized, you know, I needed Jesus Christ or I was going to die with, mm. with nothing. And my life changed after that moment, after uh, that moment from Jesus, um, uh, a pardon receives. Uh, yep. And that's what happened to me. And after that, uh, I really uh, consciously, I was very much set against um, the whole idea of human reason. Uh, I was like, forget that. Uh, that didn't do me any good. Mm. Uh, it did, they didn't tell me about Jesus. They didn't tell me about <laughs> the Bible. Uh, so just you know, forget all that. Those people that think they're smart like me, like I was, they're just wrong, okay? And so uh, they're just rejecting God and things like that. And so I just was kind of more shut off to that whole world. But uh, kind of lately, um, kind of lately, I, and, and I had that view for about, for about five years. You know, I read the Bible. I liked reading the Bible. I liked, but that was kind of my thought about people who uh, were really into rational thinking and, and reasonable thinking. I kind of thought those people are just... Um, so far from God, but uh, you know, and I, I I loved verses like First Corinthians one twenty says, "Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world?" Mm. And uh, Romans three four says, "Let God be true, but every man a liar." Mm. Uh, Proverbs three five says, "Lean not unto thine own understanding." And so I love those verses, mm. and because those verses were talking about me, uh, I felt like that's what I had been doing. I was leaning to my own understanding. I was trusting men, not God. I was, um, go, I was uh, following the wisdom of this world. Mm. Um, and I still love those verses. Uh, those are all true uh, statements. But uh, God has gradually given me uh, an insight, I believe, into, um, into this idea of, of human reason. He's kind of changed my heart a little bit about this idea. Uh, and he's shown me that uh, God, uh, and, and this is uh, what the Bible says, is that really uh, God's not necessarily against human reason. God's not necessarily against our ability to understand things. Right. Uh, in fact, um, human reason, our ability, our built-in ability to reason, to understand, is the way that we understand the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the way we believe, that's the way that we believe his promises uh, right. in the first place. Uh, whether it's the initial promise, you know, of everlasting life, or when you yeah. get born again, or that you, you, you trust Jesus for that, you, you believe Jesus offers everlasting life, you put all your faith in Jesus Christ, you get born again. Uh, it's, our, it's our reason that aids us I'm not going to say it's the only thing involved, but it's our reason that it that helps us get a hold of that promise and uh, any other promise that he gives to help, to help us live the Christian life. We are aided by our ability to understand things, by our ability to reason and understand things. And uh, so God's the problem that God has is not necessarily our human reason. Um, again, human reason is necessary. And I don't think there is, a, there is a view that reason is somehow different than faith. Hmm. That faith and reason are mutually exclusive, that they, are, they don't mix. Hmm. And I don't think that's true uh, in the Bible at all. Uh, I think that they work together uh, in the Bible is what it says. But people like me, before I got saved, hmm. uh, and even me when I was saved for, for about five years, we had this view that these things are clashing they're up against each other, the faith yeah. and the reason, and that you have to, you have to pick one or the other. This is the what people's view of Christians is. These no. people out here, they right. look at us in here, and they see us doing something weird. 
They think we're doing something, some faith thing that is mysterious that they just don't get. Mm. The people that we go pass out tracts to today, a lot of them are going right. to think, what, what what must we be thinking? They're very, yeah. they think <laughs> yeah, it's going to be very weird and mysterious. Mm. What must drive us to do this? Yeah. And uh, what I would submit is that the same thing that's driving us to do that, uh, it's the same thing that drives them to do to live their life. Right. It's the same reason. Now, we do have a different spirit, and I'll talk about that, uh, but that spirit works in coordination with our faculties that are God-given in the first place, that everybody has, and so we're going to talk about that. Um, God's problem is not reason, it's human reason that excludes him. Mm. Okay. God's problem is not our brain. <laughs> It's our brain without him. And right. uh, our brain uh, without him is the problem. And that's Psalm, Psalm 111, uh, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so, uh, real knowledge. Okay, not the wisdom of this world. Okay, the, the real truth must begin with an acknowledgement of God. And that's uh, what we're going to talk about today. And... Uh, the Bible talks about this, um, and let's go to Romans chapter 1 to start. Romans chapter 1. And my major point here, this is kind of my first section uh, here, is that this thing about reason and God being more aligned than we think they are, um, it actually even occurs before salvation. Before somebody gets born again, uh, they do have an ability to reason. And I think perhaps one reason why we don't think about this a lot is because in the, the theology uh, system called Calvinism or determinism, uh, they actually don't believe that regular people are capable of any sort of accurate assessment of the mm. truth at all. Mm. Uh, they believe total depravity. So they believe that when we're lost and we're, we're bumbling around and they, they believe there, there's none that doeth good, no, not one, and all we like sheep have gone astray, there's none that seeketh after God. They interpret those things to mean, I believe those verses, but that's generally true, but they believe those things mean we cannot understand anything. Okay, we can't we can't get a hold of anything, and yeah. I just don't see that uh, in the Bible. I, the Bible says that mm. that even without the regeneration at at salvation, people understand some things yes. more than we give them credit for, right. and so we can't be walking around thinking that these people. And and I wish people when I was lost, I wish people would have confronted me more with my with my rational mind. And, and I praise God that he just came in and he did it. Amen. He did it for everybody. He came in and you know, hit me uh, with some truth in a way that I could get a hold of and understand. But I didn't have anybody present these things to me in this way. And it, there was a time in America and in Europe, uh, in Western Europe, in the time of the Reformation and, and then in the time of early America where this was more common to understand that these things could be reasoned through. Uh, in the Bible, and mm. there was a cultural attitude more that uh, you know you had to respect the Bible on right. an in, from Amen. an intellectual sense, and we've lost that. Mm. I mean, you know, when I grew up, that was not a thing. Uh, smart people, if you you ha if you didn't think the Bible was stupid, uh, you you were a laughingstock. Okay, that was yeah. like that was required. Yeah. Number one, it wasn't like that in no. colleges no. at the at the beginning. All those colleges in America at the beginning Christian. in Europe were Christian. Amen. You would have been a laughing stock if you didn't respect the Bible right. at those colleges. What has ha that's that's been a big change, and I believe that the change has happened because we've lost a grip on what exactly is the role of our human mind in apprehending the truths of the Bible, and uh, and so in Romans one, uh, my my main point here is that people that are lost understand more than we think. That's what I really want to drive home here. And uh, we exercise our human reason in relation to God even before salvation. Uh, the Bible says that we do know about God even before we're saved. Uh, we, we even understand God a little bit before we get saved. Uh, what does that mean to understand? Uh, the dictionary, Webster's 1828 says, uh, to understand means to have just and adequate ideas of, to comprehend, mm. to know, 
to understand a math problem, to understand a declaration, uh, to have the same ideas as the person who speaks, or the ideas which a person intends to communicate. Uh, I understood the preacher. The court understands the argument that is made by the lawyer. Okay, uh, To receive another definition or have the ideas expressed or intended to be conveyed in a writing or book to know the meaning, hmm. okay? So this is what I mean when I say understanding. I mean, you get it, okay? You totally get it, you understand. Um, so uh, in Romans 1, verse 18, okay? uh, the Bible says that, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So why? Why is God uh, exercising his wrath on people? Because, for no reason, no, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Okay? So the whole reason that we're accountable to God is because we understand. Okay? Yeah. God is not punishing whether it's saved people or lost people. God's not showing his wrath whether it's temporally, like in this life, or, or eternally, God is not doing any of that for mm. no reason, okay? The punishment is because we knew enough uh, to be held accountable, right. okay? Right. It's not, everyone would know it's not right to hold somebody accountable that doesn't even understand right. uh, what they did wrong, right. okay? We must know some things. And uh, it says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So there's some things about God, his eternal power and Godhead, his creation. People understand. That got a lot about God from just observe, from their observation, mm. and how are they understanding by the things that are made? They're using their normal human abilities to go outside to look around. They perceive that uh, this is a very complicated, uh, mm. uh, coherent uh, world that exists here. It's got water and food, and the temperature's just right, yep. and there's sun, and it causes things to grow and the sun comes up every day and then it goes down yep. uh, again and people are able to observe those things even with even if they're not a Christian even if they don't believe in Jesus Christ they see that and they go someone must have some some intelligent force must have created all this because we don't look at anything else and think that if it's complicated it just randomly got thrown together we don't look at a car engine or an apartment building and we don't say wow that wow. just all came together somebody had to build that somebody right. had to make that and we look at creation we think the same thing deep down now we might not consciously admit that of course I know there's people I was one of them who said there is no God okay there is no God but see you know is that we, we sometimes forget that people have pride and people deceive yeah. themselves and people lie and people don't want to admit certain things. Right. And so when we talk to people, just because somebody says, well, I don't believe in God, okay? Well, the Bible says they do at some level, right. okay? At some level. Now, they might be buried, buried deep, deep down, and that's what it's going to talk about here. But at some point, they did. They did. And they can again. Amen. Using their own mind. They can step out their front door tomorrow and it can click. They have a built-in capacity to do that. And I just know myself, sometimes I forget that when I talk to people. And I, I spend too much time, I think, trying to convince them of things that I believe that are already built in. Yep, <laughs> and I should just take this for granted, okay? I should just not really take them so seriously when people say they don't believe in God. I used to say that to people, okay? And... It would have been better if they just didn't take me so seriously, because I just I didn't know what I was talking about. Okay, no. and so um, if we keep reading here, it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him. So they did know God, and they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Mm. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts. 
and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And then I like this again here. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so they had God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So just as much as they wanted to block God out, proportionally speaking, God said, okay, all right, you're going to reject what you've been given, the awareness that you've been given uh, of God. See how that works out. And God allows you to go down that road. Yeah. But initially, okay, you had it. They did not, it wasn't that they, they did not like to retain right. uh, God in their knowledge. So they had it. They just didn't want to yeah, keep it. Right. Okay, they just didn't want to keep it. And God said, okay. Um, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with, uh, so we'll stop there. Um, so, what I'm saying here is that all people uh, have the God-given ability to believe in God. That's right. Uh, yeah. My question is, uh, how does a person exercise this ability? What do they do? Uh, the Bible's answer seems to clearly be uh, they use their reason. Our reason gives us our ability to understand God in 19 and 20. That which may be known of God is manifest in them. God hath showed it unto them. When somebody shows you something yeah. and you understand it, what happens? You just you see something with your eyes. Your eyes are connected to your brain. You believe. Okay? And your brain makes sense of it. Okay, And then that's what happens. The same thing with the creation and with God. Um, uh, it says that... Um, the problem with people uh, is not our process of apprehending things. It's that we're corrupt, okay, right. uh, since the fall, since Adam. And we have a tendency to refuse to use this process of apprehension to glorify God, to believe mm. what God says. Verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Right? Mm. So it's our spirit, really, that's the problem. Okay, yeah. our, our animating force will not use our tools mm. the way that they're that they're that they can be used that they're supposed to be used right. our spirit will say i'm just gonna go a different direction with my thoughts here i'm gonna come up with some other uh ideas um and we are fools in verse 22 professing ourselves to be wise uh we became fools not because our brain uh, is somehow broken uh, but because we don't use it for the right reasons. Right. Okay? Uh, instead, we use our reason to focus on things other than God. We use our reason and our mind to uh, put things ahead of God, whether it's, you know, ourselves or money or, uh, you know, animals or uh, things like that. We just put them ahead in our mind, and we use our mind to do those things instead. And you want to know what? We use our, when we use our mind on those things, a lot of times we do a good job <laughs> with those things. Yeah. You know, I think we don't, sometimes I've noticed recently, I don't think we give um, people that are not Christians, not believers, enough credit for the, the fact that their God-given abilities, a lot of times they use them and they do impressive things, okay? I think it's impressive yeah. that people can, like, train animals and yeah. work with animals. And, and that's like a God-given ability that we yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, but if they're not... With, if they're not, uh, if they're rejecting God, if somebody loves horses but they reject God, uh, that just doesn't make sense. They're just kind of like short circuiting. And they're like they're not using it for the way that God intended it to be used. Mm. Their their spirit is set against God, but their mind is on. You can't, you know, they're doing successful, impressive things. Yeah. Uh, and so when I see those people, I just think, man, if they would. Yeah, if they would just put God first, Amen. it would be incredible. They'd be able to accomplish a lot of things through the same powers yep. that they're accomplishing the things in their life right now. They need a new spirit. That's the problem. Uh, they need a new spirit. Um, so um, we use reason to focus on things of other God. And when we do this, God demonstrates his wrath. Um, he doesn't break our ability to focus, our ability to reason, our ability to meditate. 
He just simply allows us to go down the road we were going in our minds uh, and reap the consequences. Um, consequences here, it says in Romans 1, flawed emotions, flawed behavior, mm -hmm. but it all starts with thoughts in the mind. Um, yeah. And uh, the conclusion here, you know, before I got saved, uh, I had a perfect capacity to understand uh, that there was a creator. I knew that things that were designed had to have a designer. This is just built in things that we're all equipped with. Uh, the vehicle of my mind was running just fine. Uh, my, I was perfectly able to use logic and reason in other areas. But when it came to God, I just wouldn't. Okay? I refused to turn in that direction. I could have, so I was without excuse. That's why. Okay? Right. If we're somehow broken and unable to understand these things, I don't see how we're accountable. I don't see how anybody's accountable to anything. And so I uh, think that people, a lot of times, uh, we, we, we don't have this awareness and we talk to people, we're going to not convey that they're accountable. Because we think they just don't have the ability to get what I'm saying. Some magic thing, fairy dust needs to come over and just kind of shock them magically. Yeah. And look, the spirit... The wind bloweth where it listeth. The Holy Spirit needs to come like it did me that day and really convince them of these things. Man. But well, I, I can't, that's not my job. I can't control that. No. But I can reason with yep. them. I Man. can do that. And so I shouldn't be waiting for some kind of magic spirit uh, thing to happen that I can't control. What I have to do is make them understand with their own mind that they can, whatever I can help them to understand, whatever I can show them, whatever I can do. Um, the Bible also says that we also know about sin. This is another thing that we spend a lot of time trying to convince people about. But the Bible says we know this. If we just shoot over to Romans 2, 14, the Bible says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And so, uh, even from even apart from God, we know right from wrong right. at some level. Right. Okay, uh, Even before I got saved, uh, just like I understood and I could apply my mind if I, want, if I chose to, to discern God, um, I could also apply my mind to discern right and wrong. Mm. Um, I knew that. It's, a, it's called a, a conscience. Amen. Uh, and it's our God-given conscience that has the ability, whether you want to think of that as part of the mind or not, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but it is a part of us uh, that we have. And it gives us the ability, I think it's in the, I think it's in the brain, frankly. I think that we, uh, I think that again, you know, uh, I don't want to sound too much like I'm just uh, talking from a psychology book and <laughs> using the, what, what parts of the brain do what. But again, are those people not using their powers of reason to figure some things out? Yeah. I mean, I think they kind of are. Now they've rejected God. That's a problem, okay? But right. they're, I, I don't think they're, I don't think people doing these science experiments and things and looking at MRI machines are, what are they, wrong about what they're finding? So I think they say that, man, we, we discern right and wrong and, and that it develops at a certain age. This is all in psychology textbooks, okay? And the Bible says the same thing. Uh, so I think that, the, basically, the mainstream psychological view of how we know right from wrong in our, in our mind with our God-given body is correct. Amen. Um, and uh, now, it's... it's uh, so what is... Uh, the conscience, okay? Now, of course, the problem is that our nature, just like with the mind, will not apply it consistently, okay? It's, it's flawed. We will be hypocrites we are susceptible to becoming even more inconsistent and inaccurate in our conscience over time. Our conscience mm. can be seared. Our conscience can be yeah. uh, you know, ruined by our decisions over time. Really, it, it'll get ruined by our rejection in the mind of God, as Romans 1 said. Uh, but in John 8, we're going to see this. If we go to John chapter 8, in verse 9... Uh, Jesus is uh, talking about the, uh, this is where the woman is caught in adultery. And the uh, Pharisees have, uh, are about to stone her. Hmm. And Jesus says, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And in verse 9 it says, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, 
went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Hmm. So that does not say that God revealed to them hmm. through some supernatural process that they were wrong, that they were hypocrites. Uh, they knew they were being hypocrites. Right. They knew that they were wrong. And uh, so, now, Jesus was doing a good job of conveying the truth, uh, but they it says their own conscience. Uh, and so we can do that as well, okay? We have the ability to become convicted. So when we speak to people and we mm. tell them right and wrong from the Bible, mm. and they say, well, I don't believe in, in, you know, sin, or I don't think I'm a sinner, or I don't think I'm... Uh, less holy than God, or I don't think I haven't met God's standard. Everybody knows that they have, I believe. Everybody knows mm. that, that wrong things are wrong uh, at some level, or at least they knew it at one time, and God can use their innate, natural knowledge uh, of sin. Uh, what does uh, the conscience mean? Uh, the dictionary says that uh, conscience is internal or self-knowledge. Very similar to understanding here. Or judgment of right and wrong, the faculty, power, or principle within us which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections and instantly approves or condemns them. It's like they got the definition right from Romans there. Conscience is called by some writers the moral sense and considered as an original faculty of our nature. And this is from a secular, basically, understanding. Um, others question the propriety of considering conscience as a distinct faculty or principle. They consider it rather as the general principle of moral approbation or disapprobation applied to one's own conduct and affections, uh, alleging that our notions of right and wrong are not to be deduced from a single principle or faculty, but from various powers of the understanding and will. So basically, he's saying the same thing I was saying earlier about how some people aren't sure whether the conscience is its own separate thing or whether it's just something we call our mind's ability right. to know right and wrong. Mm. Um, and so either way, it's an innate faculty, uh, according yeah. to the Bible. Uh, but of course, like I said earlier, um, you know, it, it's broken. It's not, it's, it's not firing perfectly. Now, not firing perfectly doesn't mean not working at all. That's the big thing that I'm, God's been showing me lately. Mm. Uh, from the Calvinist perspective, it's not working at all. Mm. Okay? From, from, I believe, what the Bible clearly says is it is working. It's just uh, because if it's not working, how can we be accountable? And, of course, from the Calvinist view, it doesn't really matter anyway because God's going to, come in and force you to either get saved or not get saved anyway. It's already been yeah. pre-planned, so they don't have the same concerns that I have about uh, judgment and about accountability for judgment. And so, uh, to them, it's just God does it, and we shouldn't even talk about it and question it at all. But I don't think that's what the Bible says. I believe that the conscience is defiled, uh, but that doesn't mean that it never works. The Bible says it does work to some degree. And that actually it's so accurate that it's going to be used against us in our own judgment. Okay? So if it doesn't work, God's going to replay, okay, uh, at the great white throne judgment, I believe, uh, yeah. lost uh, people without who never trusted Jesus Christ are going to have their own internal monologue testify against them to say that God's going to say, you knew that was wrong. Okay? Mm. You even said it. You saw somebody else do that, and you judge them, and God's going to say, you were right. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's why you're condemned, though, because you do the same thing. Okay? And so that's the idea here. Uh, if, that, if it wasn't good enough, if our sense perception wasn't good enough, it was so tainted, uh, that then, then God wouldn't be just to use it against us. We could rightfully say, God, I was just a human being. I was a mess. I, I couldn't understand you. But God's going to say, nope, not good enough. Uh, you could have understood me. And so we have to be saying that. We have to be conveying that same message. Not just telling people, well, one day, you know, hopefully the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will just help you to see some truth, you know, and uh, you'll realize something. Well, we can help them realize it right now. Okay, that's what uh, I realize I need to spend more of my time doing when I talk to people. Rather than just hoping for the best, giving them some... Bible quote out of context, and God can use that. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, I hope he, I hope he has many. But, um, but is that the most productive thing? Um, we got to try to help them understand. That's right. what Jesus did, and we're going to talk about that. But in First Timothy four two, uh, it says, "Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron." 
So that can happen. Titus 1.15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So our conscience, I'm not saying it's wor it's uh, working perfectly, but it's uh, good enough yep. that it knows right from wrong. That's right. Um, if we go back to Romans 1.32, actually which we didn't get to before. But if we see Romans 1, 32, uh, it says, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So this is, this is pretty, this blew my mind when I read this in the light of what I was studying. We even understand the penalties. <laughs> we yeah. don't just understand right and wrong according to the Bible. We actually understand that the wages of sin is death. Yeah. And so that's built in. Now, how will they hear without a preacher? Uh, that's They need to hear about the, the gift of God as eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, amen. But they know that the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 132. People know that, amen. which is interesting. And you might say, well, that seems crazy. Well, even when I was lost, I didn't know I was going to die. Now, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know it, all the Bible said about eternity and life after death and things like that, but I didn't know I was going to die. I love when I'm uh, preaching at the jail, and I love uh, telling the, the guys there, you know, I don't, you don't have to, I don't have to read you any Bible. I don't have to convince you of anything to know that you're going to die. Mm. Everybody knows that, okay? And yet, they're not doing, when I was lost, you're not really doing anything about it. And so, in a way, is that not proof that you kind of know you're condemned? Uh, there's no basis for anybody really to believe that they have everlasting life, that, they, that they're eligible to overcome the mm. death sentence that they've seen yeah. issued to their mother and father and grandmother and grandfather. Mm. And on what basis do they think they deserve anything other than that? They really, deep down, and they might say they do, but this is what I'm submitting. I, I don't think they really do. I mean, uh, when I was Catholic, I could I could have told you, well, I'm Catholic. I, I got I got my first communion and I mm. confessed my sins to the priest, and so yeah, I think I'll be okay. I didn't really believe that. Mm. <laughs> I didn't really understand that because that's yeah. not even what the church even says. So it's like, mm. you know, a lot of times I think we give people we give people's excuses and things they're saying to us at the moment a little too much credit. Um, and uh, the Bible says that actually everybody knows that there's a judgment coming and that they're basically guilty, um, even in their lost state. Uh, they need to hear about Jesus Christ, Amen. and we need to just assume that we just got to plug in right. the gospel, Amen. and boom, it'll just fire up. But sometimes I find myself spending too much time trying to explain all this other stuff right. that the Bible kind of says is built in to right. human beings. Um, so before I got saved, uh, I did know right from wrong. Uh, I believe I can look back and see that. I knew that uh, I was worthy of death. And that's kind of what I'm saying is you might say, is that, that's harsh. People don't think they're worthy of death. Well, I certainly didn't think I was going to live forever. Right. Okay. And so mm. I had a conscience that even though it was defiled, told me I wasn't perfect. Uh, even uh, and, and that I was going to die with no serious claim that I deserved anything other than that. And uh, I just refused to really think about it. It wasn't that right. I didn't understand. Right. Um, it just, I just didn't think about it. And even if I did, I was just unconvinced, maybe, that there was anything I could do about it. And that's, again, the gospel plugs right into here. Uh, they just need to hear the gospel should be a very natural thing to hear to solve all these problems that are just manifest in them, Romans 1 says. Um, and so how about the moment of uh, salvation? Uh, we talked about, these are, these are like the lost condition I've been talking about. But what about the moment of salvation? I think that there is another misconception, generally, that uh, um, we go a little too far uh, at, in Christianity, I guess, as a whole, thinking that the moment of salvation is a mystical, emotional experience. Um, and I say this somewhat reluctantly because I, when I got saved, there was a... A real like supernatural experience. So I'm like I'm not this like my I, something hap something 
completely that's never happened to me before it happened to me God spoke to my heart he used but he used my own mind you know to do it but it was it was a supernatural experience so I'm not discounting that but I don't see uh, a mystical emotional experience really required in the Bible um, what I see is um, that we have to believe which is again a, a, a mind thing uh, we have to believe specifically uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, is the gospel in verses 3 through 18 um, we have to believe specifically that God raised Christ from the dead and on that basis God will raise us from the dead Amen. and you know you might say well that's a, a supernatural thing I, I agree and uh you know, I don't know how to make that happen. I can't raise myself from the dead. I can't raise anybody else from the dead. But I do understand what that means. No. Uh, I know what life is. I know what death is. I know what everlasting life as a concept is. It's life yeah. forever with no death. Amen. Uh, and so I, you know, it's, it's something that the mind can get a hold of. And so when people hear that there's that... You know, and I'm a huge fan. I, I love telling people you must be born again because then you do. And I told that somebody last night and they got it. But as I explained it, what does that mean? Okay, what does it mean you must be born again? It means what I just said. You need to believe, be fully persuaded of basically a proposition that Jesus Christ, the gospel, uh, what Paul says is the gospel according to the scriptures. Jesus came, uh, he, was, he, he died, he was buried, he rose again according to scriptures. They need to accept that that happened and that on that basis they can inherit everlasting life as well. Um, and uh, now, to what degree it's going to be an emotional experience for them to, to have that moment happen? I think that's between them and God. I don't know, no. I don't know what is going to be the circumstances exactly. Uh, I've heard a lot of different testimonies and it's different for different people. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to dwell on, there's got to be some big, huge, it does have to be a moment, uh, where, but what's the moment? The moment where you get a hold of something, okay, a truth. You're fully persuaded that what he had promised he's also able to perform. And this is in Romans 4. Let's go to Romans 4. I don't uh, hear this a lot when we talk about the gospel and getting saved, but in Romans 4, this is talking about the mental process that it takes to get born again. Uh, what happens, let's see if we can see, uh, and I believe what happens to Abraham here is what happens is what needs to happen to everybody. And I believe that even though I had a supernatural kind of experience, this is what happened in my mind when I got saved. And I believe in everybody who gets saved, this is what, this is what the wheels that need to turn, the gears that need to shift. And... Um, because that's what the Bible says is what happens when people get saved. Because it says in uh, Romans 4, um, verse uh, 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, uh, Abraham, uh, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, for that, for that persuasion, for that mental shift, that he had, uh, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And so uh, what that's saying is that um, that verse 17 there, Abraham believed that God quickeneth, he believed that that God that he was listening to quickeneth the dead. That God can has power over life and death. Amen. And then he said, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I believe that's speaking of God's ability to promise something now and guarantee that's going to happen in the future. 
Amen. Right? And so if you just believe those two things in the context of Jesus Christ, God could, could raise you from the dead. And even though it's not going to happen today, it's going to happen later. You're going to get resurrected later. Man. Uh, that's it. That's the, that, therefore, it will be imputed to you for righteousness. That's what people are missing. They're not missing uh, necessarily an experience. They're missing a belief that God made a way for that to be possible and that it could, it's possible for them. It's going to happen for them. The God's really going to do it. And if you just believe that, that's what happened to me when I got saved. Although there was some supernatural elements to it, uh, that all that was true. The day yeah. I got saved, I realized I was going to live forever because of Jesus Christ. Because Amen. God raised Jesus Christ, and uh, he was going to do the same thing for me. Praise the Lord. And that's it's as simple as that. Now, I don't want to tell anybody that they have to attach really anything other than that to them. If they want to break down crying because they're so happy about it, or if they want to... Uh, but, but they need to understand that... Their problem is that they're walking around, and we need to understand that their problem is they're walking around not persuaded of that. They don't see any basis for why for, for this. And they don't they don't in their mind believe it. And so we have to appeal to their mind yes. and say that I have good reason to believe that this is possible. Okay? I have Amen. good reason to believe that. It's based on the authority of the Bible. And it's based on, it's clearly what the Bible says. Do they know that? Probably not. If they don't know that that's clearly what the Bible says, mm. how, how are they going to get fully persuaded of it? On what mm. basis? Right. Because I said so? Well, maybe do I, have a, do I have a very clear testimony of it happening to me? That's pretty persuasive. How do you get persuaded of anything? Okay? Right. You've got to have good reasons. Okay? Ethos, pathos, logos is in school. That's what I teach people, how you persuade people of things. If you remember English class, uh, Elijah, you probably study that in English class, maybe next year, freshman year. Ethos, pathos, and logos. There's three things that the Greeks, when they came up with how to persuade people, that you use to persuade people. Uh, ethos is the expert testimony. Logos is facts and reason and logic. And the pathos is emotion. Okay? So there's not, I'm not against emotion. What Jesus did for me in my life and changed my life, uh, and I, I feel that I feel great emotions towards God a lot of times, mm -hmm. but it's not. Some people are more want reasons, okay? They want facts, uh, especially what I found um, men. I think that in our culture, uh, especially this is one one problem that we have is men in general don't really respect. Christianity, the Bible, at all. Uh, even a lot of men who I think are saved just kind of go through the motions. They don't really take, they don't deal with this with the same powers of their mind that they deal with their job mm. or that they deal with. They're not really engaged right. like they are. And, you know, one reason that they think they're not accountable to be as engaged with this is they think that it's not the same part, it's not the same thing as them getting better at their job. Men know right. what's good and what's bad, and if you're doing a quality job or not, and they, they understand that in their mind. And they understand getting better and progress and things. And then when they come to this, they think it's some experience that they must just not be getting or something. Mm. It's because we're not really conveying that this thing works the same way everything works. Uh, you need to study it, you need Amen. to learn it, you need to practice, you need to get experience and reps and get better. And uh, it's just like you need to do anything else. And we've divorced it from normal experience, and we've made it kind of, I think, in general, a more of an emotional thing that it, that's, you know, general, that roughly speaking uh, is more of the pathos, and it's just more, of, it's more appealing to women and, and kids. And if we look at churches, it's basically in a lot of churches, it's mainly women that are driving the, the thing, that are, that are yeah. going more and more faithful, that take it more seriously. Why? Well, that wasn't always the case. No. Uh, and I think it's because we've kind of dropped the whole rational aspect of it uh, that mm. men kind of click in with a little bit. And so we'll talk about the Spirit. The Spirit's involved, but here's some other verses. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, Who will have, God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3.7 says there, people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
So they are learning. They're just, again, it's the wrong direction. Right. Um, 2 Timothy 3.15, from a child, Paul tells Timothy, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, uh, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. And so that's, uh, we see this mental, rational language that's applied over and over again in the Bible to the real problem is not knowing the truth, not right. receiving the love of the truth, not taking the truth and realizing it's the truth above all, above all other things. And uh, that's what happened to me uh, when I got saved. I realized it was true. Um, and so there were some other factors that happened to me personally, but... I don't know how it's going to work with everybody else, but I know that the common thread that we all have is that we get fully persuaded that what God promised, he was able also to perform. And uh, how about telling others about getting saved? Uh, what I've been saying a lot, I haven't really used the Bible verses for it yet, but uh, I think it's going to line up. 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Acts 17, 2, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Acts 18, 19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Mm. Matthew, if we go to Matthew 22, Jesus did the same thing. So Paul was reasoning with um, Matthew 22 and Jesus did the same thing verse 41 while the Pharisees were gathered together Jesus asked them saying what think ye of Christ whose son is he they say unto him the son of David and he saith unto them how then doth David in spirit call him Lord saying the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool if David then call him Lord how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Mm. Now mm. how did Jesus how did Jesus communicate? With reason. Right. Okay? He asked him a question. He gave him a quote, a reason from the Bible. Now this was tailored to the, the Jewish audience, but we see in Acts when Paul talks to the Greeks uh, that don't have the knowledge of the Old Testament, he still basically uses the same approach. He looks around and he sees there's a statue to the unknown God. And he says, see, look, you got a statue here of the unknown God, but I'm telling you he's been revealed. Paul was reason. That's reasoning. With you, yes. Okay? Thinking about where, what do you think exactly? Uh, where are you at with this? And then how can I tell you something? That's what it takes to get, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And um, even the miracles, a lot of times, you know, we get really into certain uh, people get really into this idea of the miracles and uh, make that like the focus but the purpose of the miracles was to get them to believe a specific truth uh, that Jesus was the Christ the way that God made for them to be redeemed it was to help them make the rational choice to believe in God so what they were supposed to do what that what got them saved was not going oh I, I believe in miracles <laughs> it was what got them saved was these people are doing miracles on the authority of God. They must be from God. They're telling me that God has made a way that Jesus is the Christ. I need to believe that. Amen. So it still came down to that rational moment with Jesus. Amen. Where you have to at some point believe that God, that Jesus is the way that God made for you to live forever. That's really what it boils down to. The miracles were just to get you to that point. Right. Um, so... Um, John uh, 4, 28, 29, we see the same thing with the woman at the well. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? So again, the purpose of the demonstrations of anything else was to get you to believe the proposition. So I would actually submit that, now that I think about it as I talk, even stuff about emotions and even stuff about how Jesus changed my life and which is all true and good the purpose of all that 
is to get them to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the one that God made for them to live forever. It's not to get them to think, oh, that that's good, good for me, that that, that that helped, or that's a nice story. The purpose of that is just as a vehicle to get them to a place where they'll accept, they'll receive the love of the truth in their mind as it applies to them. Um, John 7, 31 uh, the Jews said many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these, which this man hath done? <laughs> so they're saying, I think the miracles are telling us that this is the way that God made. This is the, the Messiah. This is the eternal king. This is the, uh, the redeemer. Amen. Um, John 14, 11, Jesus says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Mm. The purpose of the miracles and the works is so that you'll believe God, actually. Amen. Really, the, just like Abraham, we have to believe God right. sent Jesus. Amen. Uh, there's a lot of emphasizing Jesus, of course, which uh, is a great thing. But really, God is who we're believing, actually. Right. And he sent Jesus. Um, not believing Jesus directly. Jesus was just giving the message. And he says that over and over again in the Gospels. Um, so what about some... Uh, I always like to think of whenever I'm on a track like this, of uh, maybe we're missing something or something, or not, I'm not explaining this the right way. I like to think of like objections that, that people might have to say that I'm going on the wrong track and I try to see if those have any merit. And so am I making too much of the human mind or the intellect. And that crossed my mind as I was studying. Is that happening? Can we really even grasp these things? Aren't the ways of God higher than the ways of man? Amen. And uh, that's all true. And so I really wondered that. And uh, But again, as I said, understanding uh, how it happens, like actually mechanically speaking, being able to create, being able to give life and predict the future, that's not the same thing as uh, understanding concepts. Understanding that God can do those things is what I'm saying we can do. I'm not saying we can actually do them. I think the ways of God are higher. But that doesn't mean that we can't understand the things that he's revealed. Because Deuteronomy 29, and this is the verse that God gave me when I was having that, uh, that thought. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. And so my, my question there is, why would God... And so see, this is kind of how I, how I... Even when I... And we all do this, by the way. When we study the Bible, when we meditate on God and our life, we're reasoning. We're right. using our mind. And we're thinking, God, is this... You know, God, is this true? Am I going on the right track here, God? And then you'll show me this, and then I'll ask a question about it in my mind to say, well, God, why would you reveal something if it was so crazy that it was just going to confuse me? Right. And he says in the Bible, well, actually, you're right about that because uh, there certainly are things that we that got that that are too high for us to even comprehend right. with our right. mind. But God's not the author of confusion. Right. Amen. And God says that. He chose to reveal certain things to human beings. And so if we can't get a hold of them, what was the point? He could have just kept them secret. The Bible says the things which have been revealed are for us. Why? So that we can just be confused and so that we can be ever learning and never come to the knowledge of the truth? No, so that we can uh, do all the words of the law. It's practical. We, if we can't understand, we can't do anything. Right, okay? And right. so we must be able to understand. Uh, the human mind must have some ability to get a hold of these things. Uh, what about our heart? Am I emphasizing the mind too much and not the heart? Um, Romans 10.10, 10, it says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So is believing, isn't what I thought is that, you know, what some might say is that isn't believing more of a heart thing, and that's the emotion when you get saved. Um, well, I don't think that when the Bible says heart and mind, that it's really referring to two different things. I think that's how we think in mm. the Western culture, but I think that it, in the Bible when they say heart, mind, soul, 
uh, it's referring to just the person. Okay, so I, I don't think there is heart believing and mind believing. When the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, does that mean mind only but not heart? Mm. When the Bible says, uh, love God with all your heart, does that mean don't love him with your mind? Are they, or are they just trying to say, with your whole person? Amen. Okay, with your whole person. And that is called, uh, it's called synecdoche, mm. using a part to refer to the whole. And it is known as, basically, I didn't know this, but it's known as a literary device that Jews particularly would use when they would write these things. So when, when they would say, you know, if, for example, when it says, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, love the Lord God. I think he's just restating that you really need to do it with your entire person, okay? Everything, Amen. and I'm going to tell you different parts, uh, but what I'm saying is your whole fiber of your being, your whole, your whole, everything you've got, give it 110 percent. That's what they're saying. Uh, they're not saying, hey, I'm talking about the heart only, not the mind now, okay? That makes that reduces a lot of stuff to nonsense when you're saying, is he speaking specifically to the heart and mind? How can we know? Um, I don't think there is a difference between being fully persuaded in the heart and being fully persuaded in the mind. I think you're fully persuaded, you're fully persuaded. No. Uh, and I think that's confusing to people when right. you say that it's got, you, you might know, you might believe in your head, but not your heart. And we say that to people, I've said it before, to people that are supposedly Christians, they're not, they're, they say they're Christians and they right. say they, they believe, but, but, uh, what I would submit is more likely is that they really just don't believe. When they say that I have known it since I was a kid, what I would question is, did you ever get fully persuaded? Okay, mm, Rather than to say, well, you believed in your mind. I don't think they believed in their mind but not their heart. I think they probably, they maybe just never believed. Right. Okay, And we say that knowing the facts of the gospel is called believing in the mind. Uh, I don't think knowing the facts of anything is believing anything. I know plenty of facts that I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I know what Muslims believe. I know the facts of what Muslims believe, basically. I know the facts of what Buddhists believe. I just don't believe them. Right. So when you're a little kid in church, yeah. you know the facts. Going to church is just like taking a class on Islam or Buddhism. You're just taking a class yeah. in what some adults believe. Do you believe them, though? Not just because you heard them. Right. Okay? Not just because you heard them. Uh, you, you have to get fully persuaded that... Jesus died for your sins. So if you're telling me that, um, you know, if, if my follow-up in that is always, well, do you believe, are you sure you're going to live forever? Yeah. And they say no. Well, then, they then they're not fully persuaded because yeah. the persuasion is that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. He called Amen. those things which be not as though they were. They never got fully persuaded, or they've just never been taught, yeah. you know, that that is what happened. So I think that's confusing too much to separate the heart and the mind in the Bible, uh, and I think that's basically a Western cultural thing that we do, that we think everything's all separate. In Eastern cultures, generally, they think everything's more interconnected, and uh, the Bible is more of an Eastern cultural, uh, Judaism is more of an Eastern cultural, Middle Eastern thing. Uh, so it makes sense for a lot of reasons. Um, James 2.19, yeah, well, the devils also believe and tremble. Yeah. I've heard this, where people say, well, um, the devils believed, and that wasn't enough. They were missing some kind of real important feeling. Well, the, the, it doesn't say that the devils believed in Jesus Christ for everlasting life. No. That's the point they there. So they, they had some knowledge of, of God. They didn't believe Jesus Christ died for their sins. Okay? So that was their problem. You know, that, that salvation is about believing Jesus Christ died for your sins, not right. about believing in one God or something. Right. Uh, so they have to get fully persuaded of the gospel is what I'm talking about. So um, that's not, um, I don't think, a good thing to bring up uh, in this context. What about uh, the Holy Spirit? Well, let's go to John 16. So have I neglected to talk about the Holy Spirit? Um John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. 
And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Albeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, um, notice that that everything that he says that the Holy Spirit is going to reprove people of, sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, the righteousness of God, their own sin, uh, their own imp impending judgment, actually we've already looked at all three of those and seen the testimony of the Bible that at some level people already know all those three things. Yeah. Okay, so the Holy Spirit... I do not believe works contrary to the mind. I believe that those three things, we all understand by default, the Spirit is not inventing new concepts for people of sin and judgment and righteousness. He is reproving. He's convincing. He's bringing it to the forefront of the mind. That's what happened to me when I got saved, when the Spirit convicted me. He forced me to deal with all these things. Amen. You're going to die. Okay, God made a way for you to not die. You want to take that way? You can, because it's Amen. real. Amen. And I believe that. I got fully persuaded. But that was all my... The Holy Spirit, instead of inventing new stuff, it's almost like the Holy Spirit just blocked out all this other nonsense that I wanted to use to reject God and said, I'm not letting you use any of that. You're going to have to sit with this reality and the, and the truth that the Jesus, the, the truth, the gospel that you've heard. Amen. You're going to have to deal with that right now and in your mind. And I said, okay. And I believed it. I got fully persuaded. Um, so I don't think that the Holy Spirit is an alternative form of knowing. I think that we think about it like that sometimes. I've definitely thought about it like that sometimes. Well, I know, well, uh, you know, the Spirit, um, but it says the Spirit will guide you into all truth. Okay, guide you. And so I believe that the Spirit just moves you, okay? It's a force that moves you toward using your powers, that, that your God-given powers, for God. Amen. Okay? Rather than being some mysterious new thing that we can't really explain to people, we just have to tell them, hopefully you get it someday. Amen. Okay? It's basically what we're left kind of explaining sometimes about this spiritual stuff. And I can tell you that as somebody that is a more of a more rational mind, when you hear this stuff about the Holy Spirit, and you're just walking around, you think that's totally nuts. Okay? You do. And I'm not saying they're account everybody's yeah. accountable to God. So I, they, they need to figure it out. They, they're accountable to pursue the truth. But, you know, it's not persuasive. Right. If you're not like that, if you're not interested in right. getting, you know, having, you know, weepy good feelings all the time, uh, it, it's not something that you are like, wow, they were talking about something called the Holy Spirit. I want to, I really want to investigate that more. <laughs> it's not something that they're going to do. And so, uh, but the Spirit, you, I've, I've heard test the Spirit can work with people to use their rational mind to pursue the truth and get convinced. That's the Holy Spirit working when they do that. Right. Uh, when they when they dig into the Bible, I, then I looked in the Bible and it said this, and I realized that was true in my life. So the Spirit's using their mind. And so uh, I don't think, and to say that the Spirit is some alternative whole knowing process is really, um, I don't know where it is in the Bible. I don't know where, it, we can't really explain it if it is a thing. And so I find it, um, um, difficult to use to persuade men. Uh, and I don't think it's supposed to be like that. You know, in Jesus and Paul, um, they got to points where they said, you know, people uh, just are just rejecting the truth. Uh, and so we kind of kicked the dust off your feet kind of attitude and said they just won't hear. Hearing, they won't hear. Seeing, they won't believe. And uh, Paul said, you know, I'm leaving. You guys had a chance after three days in the synagogue and you're just opposing yourselves and you just won't accept it. But that's after they explained a lot of mm. rational, reasonable concepts. Yeah. I think that my in my uh, witnessing to people, sometimes I get there a lot quicker than Jesus and Paul did. I go, they just, 
<laughs> not they just won't receive the spirit they just they just won't listen to God maybe they just don't understand mm -hmm. and that's what Jesus and Paul kind of assumed they just kind of assumed I just need to explain it more mm -hmm. and then yeah. once it became clear that they did understand it they just were rejecting it then they got to say all right I'm done but I think we get there a lot too quick and we use as an excuse well it's some it's some spiritual heart thing that I don't understand they're just set set aside uh, when really it could just be that something has not clicked in their mind. Right, amen. And so that's really what Jesus and Paul did more, and I think we need to do the same thing. And then real quickly, uh, after salvation, uh, I talked about before, the moment of salvation, our Christian life here after salvation is also based on the mind and making rational decisions. Um, why would we go pass out tracts like we're going to go do today? Um well, because we figure it's, we figure, which is a mind word, okay, we figure it's worth it. We believe the propositions that God would receive glory through that, that the word of God's not going to return void. We believe that, that will have, it will bear fruit. There's a purpose. Uh, we believe others will benefit from it. And we even believe that God will reward us in some way for it. Uh, in Romans 6, let's go to Romans 6 real quick. Uh, just briefly, let's talk about the Christian life here in Romans 6. And um, in verse 11, Paul instructs the believers to reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that reckon word, um, you know, he even starts with the question in 6.3, 6 2, think about, think about how reasonable Paul is when he writes these things. Mm. In 6 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let's think about that. Okay? Is that true? God forbid. No. He says that's not true. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he doesn't assume they even understand what he, what he means there. He goes on to explain it. Paul's a great explainer of things. He never just says, well, it's what God says. Right. So just accept it. Right. Okay. Now, of course, God is God, and he has a right to say things and for us to obey, but God is an explainer. That's what Amen. the Bible is. Uh, Paul is an explainer. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, again, a good logical word, a transition word that implies that for that reason, we're buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For yet as dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God likewise. Just like that example I gave you that I brought back into your mind, reckon ye also yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's saying the whole point, the whole thing of the Christian life is a mental thing. Yeah. Okay? He says you got to remember. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, or yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, he says... If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, uh, unless you have believed in vain. He's saying you've got to keep this in mind. Don't we say Amen. that to people? Keep it in mind. We've got to remember, oh yeah, should I should we sin? Should we continue in sin and just accept the grace of God? No, God forbid, he says, because Jesus, what you're supposed to do instead is die unto sin, like Jesus died, and he rose again and he lives for God. And you and your baptism picture the death, and you've risen again. Amen. And you're living for God now, just like that. And so reckon, remember that in your, in your mind. Kind of just even do a little visualization. You're dead in your, uh, to your own desires, okay? And Paul says, I die daily. Crucify uh, the flesh, and then you raise again to walk in newness of life. And so this is a mental process that has to be remembered on a regular basis, recalled in the mind. Uh, if we're trusting on, well, I just hope I get a spiritual feeling or uh, good feelings about God, we're not going to be very productive 
uh, because we might feel like doing this, we might not feel like doing this, right. but we have we can do it anyway. That's the power of our mind. Mm. Um, and the Spirit will enable us to do it. Okay, that's the Amen. Spirit will enable us to do it. Without the Spirit, you can say, I want to live for God. You can still reckon, you know, I, I want to do the right thing. But we just can't do it. Right. Okay, we just can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So, uh, um, uh, Hebrews 11, talking about why we do things. Hebrews 11, again, I just see, I, 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 I didn't mean to talk about any of these things. Hebrews 11, I don't have time to go all through this, but uh, a great verse, a great chapter about exactly what I'm talking about, about how we have to believe promises uh, in our mind and that that will motivate us to do great things for God. Um, but if we go to verse um, 19, it says that Abraham, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Man. That word, accounting, he was literally figuring. Numbers, it's a number word. Sure. That's logos, okay? That's the mind, that's the powers of reason. He figured that God, because he already believed that, actually, by this point, by Isaac, he already knew God had power over life and death. So that's what allowed him to offer up Isaac, because he believed in his mind that God could raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. If we keep going, I want to see um, 11, uh, 35. It says, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. How did they do that? Um, why did they do that? Was it from necessarily a great feeling? Uh, they did it that they might obtain a better resurrection. So they actually had a rational hope that it was worth it. Okay? They accounted that God would somehow make this worth it to endure. We have to do the same thing, but Amen. you can't do that unless you believe promises that God's made that he will do that. Um, and so another just tendency that we have um, that I've come to see is that there is no such thing as faith in general. Uh, there is no, if somebody says, well, I have faith, mm. okay, that tells me nothing. <laughs> I have faith. I, you got to keep the faith, okay? Faith, my question is, faith in what? That's right. <laughs> There's Amen. got to be a, a thing. Okay? We have faith in things, promises, statements. Okay? In Hebrews 11, it goes through and it says that, um, that faith um, is in things. Noah, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. house. Noah had great faith. Amen. Okay, but not a real general faith. He wasn't just a guy who's saying, I'm just real spiritual. He specifically believed that God told him a flood was coming, and he believed that statement. And so that's what caused him to build that ark. And he said, and so we've got to have faith in things, propositions, statements. And that's what, that's what the Bible's for. Yep. Uh, and so that our mind can apprehend uh, statements that are in there. We can read them and believe them and trust them. It can motivate us to do more. Um, and uh, again, the Bible itself, uh, the fact that our whole you know, basis for everything is the Bible uh, is, again, uh, a huge uh, indicator of the importance of the mind. Reading, <laughs> reading is a brain activity. Okay? Just the fact that we would say, this letter makes this sound and makes this word, what do you think you're using to do all that? It's your brain. Okay, it's your brain, and so we must. God must be a fan of our brain and our mind's ability Amen. to apprehend things. He delivered the whole thing through a book. Okay, so the fact that people have this perception has just gotten very sad to me in the last year. That people have a perception of Christians like they are not rational people. <laughs> but we should be the most rational people. Man. We're, the, we're the people that, what, our whole religion is a book. It's reading a book, okay? And, you know, in history, this has been seen. Um, you know, that nobody was allowed to have the book for a long time in history, in the Middle Ages. And then the printing press was invented, and everybody read the book. And they got very 
rational about the book. They realized what I'm reading is not what the Catholic Church is saying. And so I believe this rather than that. They were using their mind, and it caused whole countries to be able to read, and they taught everybody to read, mainly to read the Bible. And it was those countries in Western Europe, England, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, and then America, that then those countries invented everything. Mm. Right. Amen. Okay? Invented yeah. trains and planes. <laughs> and Don't you think there's a connection between that? Amen. It's because the, Bi it's because of the Bible. Amen. It's because the Bible is a book about using your brain and using and developing the powers of your mind. Mm. Even when we just read it, we're doing that. The Bible is such an orderly, logical book that when you just read it, you just get... Amen. Smarter, you do. Amen. And uh, we shouldn't be like shying away from that at all. Um, there's a, just a, a sad misperception that uh, we are somehow not, you know, using our brain when we talk about Jesus or when we talk about this. That should not be the case. And it wasn't always the case. There used to be an understanding of this in the culture that this was a to be respected uh, by people of the highest. Mm. You know, calibers of intellect. That's what God would want. That's what Paul did. Mm. Um, and so um, that's why it matters. Um, Jesus and Paul went out of their way to explain things using the Bible of their starting point as their starting point with the assumption that these things would be understood. And we have to do the same thing. And, you know, that's what the tracks do. That's, what, that's why I'm, I'm excited to go past the tracks out. Because that's what that's what Pastor Ford's whole ministry here was. He was a very, as I think about it more in preparing this message, he was a very rational guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he understood everything I'm saying now. I, I can remember things that he said that were right exactly in line with this. He was he was about concepts, logic. Uh, he used that in his in his Christian life to make decisions. Amen. And this whole thing, you just look around. It's a testimony to. The, the Christian life and, and the brain's ability to assist in the Christian life, him figuring out, well, we, well, what would you do if you really believe the Bible? Well, there's all these people who speak different languages. They're not, you know, it occurred to Brother Ford at some level, what the Spirit told him, is they're not going to be able to understand if they can't even understand the language. Right. And so you need to get it in their language Amen. so that they can apprehend it with their mind. And he did it. And what a blessing. And we've got this right. stuff, and we're going to go do that because we understand that these people that are Greek have a mind to understand this, that, these things. And praise the Lord, we got it in their own language so that they can get a hold of it. And hopefully they will today. And that's what I realized when I first, I didn't know uh, anybody who believed the Bible. Uh, and I wasn't sure when we first came into this church whether these people, I didn't know Brother Floor, what is, I, th I thought, well, they believe, they say King James Bible, and I figured that those people, I never met anybody like that, but I figured those people are going to be more loyal to the Bible because they think they've got the right words. And, uh, and I came in and I looked around and I saw the tracks and all the languages everywhere. And I said, this makes sense in my mind. My mind, it made sense of it. I said, if you really believe the Bible, Mm -hmm. And you really believe that we die without Christ, you know, we're going to suffer eternal death, and we're, we're not going to, you know, all we have to have to do is believe the gospel to live forever. That's what I believe. You would be doing exactly this. Mm -hmm. This is exactly, there would be a building like this where you had it written in every language of the people around, and you would be urgently trying to get them out in the various opportunities that you have. And he was doing that. Now, not perfectly, but nobody's perfect, but that was a whole. Thing that allowed it to click because it it was rational. It was a very, this thing is a very rational thing to do, Amen. and uh, and so praise the Lord for it, and um, and uh, praise the Lord uh, for the opportunity that we have today and that I've had. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Brother Pine, that's a lie. I got it. Yeah, sorry. That's a, no, that's a lie, man. You put a lie in. Unbelievable what he just told. That's a lot to take in, study your Bible. You know, faith cometh by hearing, Amen. and hearing by the word of God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, I was just looking when he was going through, so he put a lot into that. It's a lot to think on. We need to reach people in a language and what they can understand and reach them for Christ. Some people are at a lower estate, some are at a higher estate. you got to come to their estate. Exactly. And reach them. Meet, meet them it says at. here in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. So people who don't believe, they're you know, to them it's foolishness. Correct. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. But then if you go down to 
uh, verse 21, 1 uh, Corinthians 20. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It is pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both the Jews and the Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So Amen. God's gave them wisdom. He gives us wisdom to preach his word to them, Amen. to teach them, and to believe. To, to you know, God's word, I can't save. Only Jesus Christ can save. And, you know, he, he paid it on the cross with his blood. You know, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. The way to who? Back to God, to heaven. I'm the truth. He's all truth. And he, 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 you know, he, he said, I'm the way to truth and the life. The life. He's the life. He's the life. He's the way for everlasting life. And, uh, you know, John 3, John 3, 15 through 17. John 15, 3, 15 through 17. It says, that's whosoever, so that's anybody, believeth in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. That whosoever believeth should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son... Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God not sent his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So today we're going out to the parade. We're going to hand out these tracts to the Greeks, and hopefully they believe. All right, amen. Let's be dismissed. Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, for, for your word. Thank you for Ben for his teaching there that edifies us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, all things through you. We need to reach people. We need to teach things that can reach people to their mind, to their heart, to their soul. Lord, we pray for uh, just your wisdom and guidance in all things and uh, help us with this afternoon with these tracks to get them out to these people and just uh, edify uh, what we need to speak to people about. And Lord, I pray for your will in all things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to sing page number... Three seventy six. Three seventy six. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Again, keep in prayer, Allison in Texas. She's recovering uh, in uh, Shriners Hospital. Uh, uh, Steve Sajak in Texas, we say hi to. He's watching. And uh, 
May God will help him with all his needs and all the other pastors and churches around the world. Again, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your blood. Thank you for shedding your blood on the cross to save our souls, Lord. And we pray that you just uh, edify these tracks, edify us to give these tracks out this afternoon and give an answer to everybody who asks, Lord, about you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. Amen. Praise God. <laughs>